Good morning and welcome to today's presentation, Energy Efficiency Opportunities in Industrial Refrigeration. I'm Olivia Newport, a webinar support contractor to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Before we get started, let's review a few housekeeping items. Audio is available for this presentation through your computers, mic and speakers, or by telephone. Your call-in number, access code, and audio pin are in the audio section of the control panel box on the right-hand side of your screen. All attendees have been muted to minimize background noise. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box on the upper right-hand side of your screen, and we will try to address your question at the end of the presentation. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please contact us through the questions box, and we will try to troubleshoot the issues. Also, please note that there will be a post-webinar survey that appears in your browser when you exit the presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to provide your feedback. And with that, I'll pass it to Peter Pierre Giovanni, who will introduce today's speaker. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Peter Pierre Giovanni. I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, professional engineer with the EPA uh, Region 3, based out of the Philadelphia office. And I manage the pollution prevention program um, for our region. And as part of that program, we have partners um, in the field, such as the University of Delaware. And um, as a partner, they help um, manufacturers and businesses uh, with technical assistance in reducing pollution, reducing the use of energy, and saving money. Um, so today we have the University of Delaware, and they're going to talk about <clears throat> refrigeration systems. And our presenter today is Ralph. He's a professor uh, ad, uh, adjunct faculty with the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy at the University of Delaware. And with him is Keith, who's a professor of electrical and computer engineering and the director of the Industrial Assessment Center and a senior member of IEEE. And uh, without further ado, here's Ralph. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Olivia, can you just advance the next slide? Uh, Hi, uh, every, uh, I just wanted to open with a brief introduction of the University of Delaware's Industrial Assessment Center. Um, we were established in 2006. It's um, housed within the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the university. And we have a twofold mission. The first is to provide no cost industrial energy assessments throughout our region, which is the middle Atlantic part of the country. Uh, we cover manufacturing and process industries of all types. Um, but the second and very important part of this mission is to provide training for engineering students who have an interest in energy and energy efficiency. Uh, since about 2017, we've been doing assessments under an EPA pollution prevention program grant uh, targeting food and beverage processing. Um, and since our founding, we've done about 200 industrial assessments. So we have quite a bit of experience under our belts. Um, next slide, please. So we have a couple of main topics today. Um, industrial refrigeration covers a really wide range of system types, equipment, and uses. Uh, so to stay within that, within our allotted time, we're going to limit the range to the most common types of system and systems and equipment. So we'll start with a refresher on the basic refrigeration cycle and the main components. Uh, we'll summarize several energy efficiency opportunities for the systems, equipment, and refrigerated spaces. And then we'll we'll wrap up briefly. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to take a, uh, a number of questions at the end. Next slide. All right. So we'll start with uh, refrigeration basics. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first and foremost, what is refrigeration? Uh, it's basically how we move heat from a colder space to a warmer surrounding environment. Um, to move that heat, we use a refrigerant fluid which has a low boiling point and atmospheric pressure. And then we have to add work to raise the pressure and also that boiling or condensing point temperature of the refrigerant using a compressor. Next slide. So the basic refrigeration cycle, and, and I'm highlighting here vapor compression refrigeration as opposed to absorption refrigeration, a whole different category. So we're just talking about vapor compression today. Um, so the basic refrigeration cycle consists of four steps. 
Uh, the first is compression. We raise the pressure of a cold refrigerant gas that's coming from the evaporation stage. That high pressure gas is then condensed by rejecting the heat that's absorbed in the evaporation stage and the heat of compression to the external environment. Um, then that, that uh, warm, now mixed phase liquid is throttled uh, through an expansion valve and we get a cold low pressure liquid gas refrigerant that goes to the evaporator and in the evaporator that circulating cold refrigerant goes through a heat exchanger it absorbs heat from the refrigerated space and it evaporates the refrigerant um, so those are the four the four steps in any in any refrigeration cycle next slide so we can show that refrigeration cycle on a pressure enthalpy chart for any particular refrigerant. In this case, it's ammonia. Um, what this does is it shows the thermodynamic state, so the pressure and the enthalpy at each point in, in the cycle, and that's what those letters mean, A, B, C, and D are the, are the end points. Um, that dome-shaped region in the center of the chart represents the saturated state of the refrigerant where gas and liquid exist at the same time. And on the left-hand side, the refrigerant is in liquid state. At the right-hand side, it's in gaseous state. Above the top of the dome, we're in an area called the triple point where the refrigerant is at such a high pressure, there's really not a difference between gaseous and liquid phases. Refrigeration cycles don't operate above the, above the triple point. Um, normally, they operate well below that within that region that you see um, on the chart. So the next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about some of the refrigerants that we encounter uh, in any refrigeration system, not just industrial. Um, there are uh, a lot of different kinds of refrigerants, different properties, different uses, uh, and they break down really into two, two families uh, or three families. Um, halocarbons, which are CFCs, not, very, not, not in very common use today. HCFCs and HFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons. There are hydrocarbon refrigerants like ethane and propane, which aren't used very much. Uh, and then inorganic refrigerants like ammonia and CO2. Uh, the most commonly used refrigerants in industrial applications are ammonia, uh, R22, and various refrigerant blends. Um, and in large industrial systems, uh, primarily ammonia is, is in use as the, um, as the refrigerant. Next slide, please. Um, this is a table that's mainly meant for reference purposes. It shows a wide variety of refrigerants on there. R717 is ammonia. That's highlighted in the blue uh, on the slide. Um, other refrigerants, some of their basic properties are shown in the table. Uh, one of the things to note about ammonia is, is it has a very high latent heat of evaporation as well as a low boiling point, which makes it very suitable as a refrigerant. However, uh, another point about ammonia is that it's also toxic and it has to be handled very carefully, um, which is why it's really limited to industrial systems. You won't find ammonia um, in common use outside of industrial refrigeration systems. Next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to different refrigeration system types. Next slide, please. So uh, a couple of ways to classify refrigeration systems. Um, first, by equipment configuration. Secondly, by temperature range. And then thirdly, they can be either packaged or built up systems. Built up systems really are engineered systems that are designed around particular processes or requirements, and they tend to be much larger systems. Packaged systems tend to be much smaller um, using standardized components, and usually um, for, in, at least, for example, in food processing, you'll find package systems in use for smaller coolers and freezers, um, whereas in large industrial systems, they might be used for uh, large uh, tunnel chillers or spiral freezers, things that are uh, systems that are usually a lot bigger than, uh, than small, small coolers. Um, when we talk about equipment configuration, there are really um, three types. Two of them are limited to ammonia refrigeration. Um, direct expansion systems are 
generally packaged. They generally use um, the uh, H HFC and HCFC refrigerants. Um, with ammonia systems, we have two types, single stage and two stage, and they can be subdivided into overfeed and flooded systems, which doesn't really have a big bearing on what we're talking about today. Um, the other way to categorize systems is by temperature range. High temperature really means anything greater than about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, typically found in HVAC systems and um, uh, smaller refrigeration systems. Uh, medium temperature between about minus 25 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, low temperature less than minus 25. There are also very low temperature systems, which would be considered cryogenic systems. Uh, we're not going to be talking about those today. Next slide. So we're going to look at these in terms of equipment configuration. And the first type is called a DX or direct expansion system. Uh, this shows a schematic for that system. And in this type of a system, the refrigerant flows directly from the expansion valve to the evaporator. This is the simplest type of refrigeration system, often used in smaller package systems, and as I've mentioned before, usually using HFC or HCFC refrigerants. Next slide, please. So we've already seen this uh, chart, uh, but this is the pressure enthalpy chart for a direct expansion system. And you can see as you go from A to B, uh, we're condensing that, that hot refrigerant gas. Um, B to C, that, that gas is now a liquid and we're expanding it through a thermal expansion valve. Uh, it cools and then it flows to the evaporator uh, where it picks up heat and then moves from C to D where it goes into the suction of the, compress of the compressor. Next slide. Okay, in a single stage ammonia system, this is the second type of system, um, these are generally used in larger, low, and medium temperature applications. Um, these are a little bit more complex, although they're usually more efficient. And what distinguishes this type of system from a direct expansion system is that when the refrigerant leaves the expansion valve, it flows to an accumulator where there's separation between the saturated gas and the saturated liquid that's coming through the, the expansion valve. Um, that liquid flows to the evaporator while the gas flows back to the suction of the compressor. Um, a system with a recirculation pump is called an overfeed system because the rate of liquid flow in the evaporator is higher than the evaporation rate. And in a flooded system, the accumulator is located at a higher elevation so that the evaporator is completely flooded with liquid. Um, the difference is that recirculation pump and the accumulator configuration, um, it's, again, it's not really significant in terms of what we're talking about today. Next slide. So this pressure enthalpy chart is a little bit different because it adds the separation stage. Uh, and in this case, what happens is the cool gas that's leaving the evaporator goes back to the accumulator and helps to cool the liquid in the accumulator it improves the efficiency of the system. We're picking up a little bit of benefit by circulating that cool gas back over to the accumulator. Next slide. And then finally, we have uh, two stage systems. Uh, and you can think of this as two cycles that are stacked on top of each other. There are three pressure levels. There's low, intermediate, and high. The lowest pressure corresponds to the lowest refrigeration temperatures. A booster compressor in between connects the low pressure and the intermediate pressure parts of the system, and the high stage compressor connects the intermediate and high pressure parts of the system. These are typically used in low temperature or in multi temperature refrigeration systems. Um, in a lot of industrial facilities, food processing in particular, uh, there are um, refrigerated spaces that may need um, minus 10 degrees for certain products, uh, 25 degrees for other products, and then uh, 38 or 40 degrees for a third category of products. And so, so we use multi-stage systems in, um, in those types of applications. Next slide. 
And this just shows the pressure enthalpy chart for a two-stage system. And note, it's basically the same as the single-stage chart. It's just that you have two cycles stacked on top of each other. Next slide. All right, so now we'll move on to components of refrigeration. Next slide. So three major components uh, in any refrigeration system, again, are compressors, condensers, and evaporators. And this is where many of the opportunities for improving efficiency exist. Uh, the compressor is really the, the driving force to move heat from, from one place to another. It's by far the biggest energy user in the system, uh, and its job is to compress uh, that refrigerant from low pressure vapor to high pressure vapor. Um, condensers are where heat is rejected in the system and dissipated to atmosphere. Uh, we use energy there in the fans primarily, and if it's a wet system, an evaporative or, or a cooling tower type of system, uh, there are spray pumps that are used for uh, water. Um, and then thirdly are the evaporators. This is where heat is removed from the refrigerated space, um, usually uh, with air circulating over coils. Um, fans and pumps can add loads to the refrigerated space, and it's usually the second largest energy user in the system. Next slide. Okay, so first we'll cover compressors and compressor controls. Next slide. So there are two types, two main categories of compressors that are used in refrigeration systems. There are positive displacement and centrifugal compressors. Um, we're only going to cover reciprocating and screw compressors. There's a very wide range of different types of uh, positive displacement compressors. Um, Centrifugal compressors are most common in HVAC applications and in some industrial process chiller systems. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna focus on reciprocating and screw compressors. And as I mentioned before, very simply, that compressor's job is to raise the pressure of refrigerant vapor, which changes the refrigerant saturation temperature. Just remember that low pressure corresponds to a low temperature, high pressure corresponds to a high temperature. Next slide. So first we'll cover reciprocating compressors. Um, this is the oldest technology on the market, but it's still very common. Um, can be used in single stage systems or can be used as a booster compressor for two stage systems. Uh, they can be used with most refrigerants that includes ammonia and many of the HCFCs and HFCs on the market. Um, they have up to 16 cylinders. So these can be quite large. They can range in size from as small as 10 horsepower up to over 300 horsepower for ammonia systems. Um, compression ratios up to about eight to one for ammonia. Um, in terms of controls, the most common capacity control is what's called staged unloading. Um, staged unloading means that there's an actuator that's used to hold the suction valve open when less refrigeration capacity is required. Um, and these compressors typically have very good part load efficiency. Next slide. So screw compressors <clears throat> are a newer technology relative to reciprocating compressors. Uh, they can also be used in single stage or booster operation, um, generally limited to R22 or some of the other um, HFC refrigerants or ammonia. Um, they can operate at very high pressure ratios, um, above 20 to 1 in single-stage operation. Um, they can be very large. They can exceed 1,000 horsepower in some applications. Um, in my experience, it's more common to see them in the range of anywhere from 150 to up to maybe 400 horsepower. Uh, they can either be lubricated or non-lubricated, single screw, twin screw. Um, a lot of different configurations are available with these compressors. Um, they have two common capacity controls. Uh, they can be either variable, variable displacement, most common being slide valves. And basically what it means is you're varying the inlet or the discharge point of the compressor uh, 
And that can be within a very wide range of capacity, anywhere from about 10 to 100%. So they're very flexible. Um, the other way of changing uh, compressor capacity is by changing its speed using a variable frequency drive, which provides much better part load efficiencies. Um, just one point that's important about screw compressors is that in contrast to reciprocating compressors, screw compressors using slide valves to modulate capacity have much poorer part load efficiency, and that presents an opportunity. Next slide. So next, we'll look at condensers. Next slide. So there are really two types of refrigerant condensers, dry and wet. Um, dry coolers are air-cooled. Um, and because air is the coolant, uh, performance is based on the outside dry bulb temperature. So during the summer months, this is going to be over 90 degrees in many parts of the country. Um, this requires a higher condenser pressure because the refrigerant condensing temperature has to exceed the ambient temperature, usually by 15 to 20 degrees, in order to reject the heat that's picked up in the evaporator as, and the heat of compression. And that higher pressure also means more energy input to the compressor. And the configurations of these things are usually very, very simple. Uh, refrigerant vapor is condensed in a coil inside the uh, housing. Air is circulated through that housing over the coil, and that's how the refrigerant is condensed. Next slide. Evaporative condensers, um, in contrast to dry coolers, uh, depend on the wet bulb temperature. Um, water is usually circulated over the cooling coils, and air is drawn up through the condenser. That helps to evaporate the water and reduce the temperature. Um, once uh, th that lowers the temperature below the dry bulb temperature, and then it reduces, which reduces the necessary pressure and the energy input at the compressor. Um, these, the configuration, uh, next slide, please. Um, these are configured, uh, often they can fool you. They look very much like cooling towers. Um, and they do have water and circulating pumps and, and uh, a lot of the same auxiliaries as, as cooling towers. But the refrigerant is circulated directly into the tower or into the uh, evaporative condenser. And uh, water is um, usually trickled over the coils to, uh, to aid cooling. Next slide. Um, cooling towers operate in the same way as evaporative coolers. The main distinction is that there's some sort of an intermediate fluid that's being used, um, such as glycol. So instead of the refrigerant going directly to the condenser, there's an intermediate. Next slide. Okay, finally, evaporators is the third major component in the system. So the next slide, please. Um, this is uh, the heat exchanger that's located in the refrigerated space. Um, heat from the space is transferred to the refrigerant, causing it to evaporate as air is circulated over the coils. There are many types, a lot of different features and configurations, but the most common ones are finned coils with either axial or centrifugal fans circulating air over the coils. Um, there are a lot of other features that are incorporated into evaporators, and, and these include different types of defrosting, uh, different ways to manage airflow in and out. They can be freestanding, they can be suspended from the ceiling, uh, they can use centrifugal or propeller fans, belt or direct driven. I think, I think you get the idea that, that there's a lot of variety in the way evaporators are configured. And it depends uh, a lot on what the requirements are in that refrigerated space. Next slide. Um, this is an, uh, just a quick sampling from one manufacturer of the different configurations of, of evaporative coolers, uh, or I'm sorry, evaporators. Um, and they, they include the, Many of the things that were mentioned before, different fan configuration, ceiling suspended, uh, floor mounted, and so on. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, one of the things that affect energy consumption in the evaporator is the type of defrosting. And this table summarizes different types. Um, I won't read through all of these details. Um, that can be there for reference. Uh, but we're going to concentrate on the first three, which are hot gas, electric, and off-cycle when we get into the energy efficiency part of this. Next slide. So now we'll get to the opportunities for energy efficiency improvements. And next slide. So first, let's talk about where inefficiency typically comes into industrial refrigeration systems. And there are uh, several different categories. Um, the first is excessive compressor lift. Uh, the second is poor part load performance. The third is defrost controls. Uh, the fourth is unnecessary refrigeration loads. And then the fifth are auxiliary component efficiencies. So we'll start with the next slide and talking about excessive compressor lift. Uh, as we mentioned before, the compressor is the largest energy using component in the refrigeration system. And there are basically two methods to reduce the lift across the compressor. The first is to increase the suction pressure, and the second is to utilize floating head pressure control, which is a way of reducing discharge pressure. Next slide. So, compressor lift. Um, starts with, uh, you have to start with the understanding that pre the pressure temperature relationship is fixed by the refrigerant properties and the input power is proportional to the compressor lift. So that's just simply the difference between suction and discharge pressures. So by either increasing suction pressure and or decreasing discharge press pressure, we can reduce the compressor input energy. Um, a couple of points about um, uh, input power. Uh, because the condensing and the evaporation temperatures are, are often fixed set points, um, we have to remember that the condensing temperature is usually about 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the highest ambient temperature, and that can be either wet or dry bulb, depending on the type of condenser. Uh, so, for example, on a 90 degree summer day, the condensing temperature um, of the refrigerant can be 15 to 20 degrees higher than that, so up to 105 to 110 degrees. Um, the suction pressure is usually based on an evaporator design temperature differential. That's the difference between the refrigerant temperature and the space temperature of about 12 to 15 degrees. Uh, so there's always going to be a differential between the ambient and the refrigerant temperature. Next slide. So let's talk first about increasing suction pressure. Really two ways to do that. Um, the first one is just by reducing pressure drop on the suction side of the system. Um, the first thing that can be done, um, and some of these depend on the system design and some of them depend on um, uh, replacements of existing components. So if you're starting with a new system, you would try to select the largest evaporator coils that you can uh, within limits to reduce pressure drop through the evaporator. If you're in the process of revamping or overhauling a system, then you might want to consider replacing evaporator coils with larger, larger coils. Uh, the second thing is to look at suction piping size and pressure drop in that piping. And that's most important in low pressure systems because they operate at much or low temperature systems because they operate at much lower pressures. So if you're operating at say um, five psi or even vacuum in some in some um, low temperature systems, um, a pressure drop through pressure drop through the piping is going to have a much more significant impact than it would in a higher temperature higher pressure system. Um, the second way of increasing suction pressure is to evaluate the lowest temperature parts of the system. Um, in some refrigeration applications, especially older facilities, um, the, the systems are still operating using configurations that may not necessarily be appropriate for what they're currently doing. Um, and one way this manifests itself is 
by having um, um, low temperature systems that are that no longer have as much demand on them, um, which can be segregated from larger medium temperature systems that are and these would all be served by the same compressor. So if you can isolate low temperature systems, smaller low temperature systems from larger medium temperature systems, uh, you'll get an increase in efficiency because you'll be able to increase the suction pressure on the uh, on the compressors. Um, this can uh, another and the, finally, um, in some cases, the the refrigerated space temperature, you may be able to increase it even slightly, uh, just by increasing temperature by one degree. You can reduce input power to the compressor by about two percent. Um, so it's worth looking at uh, whether the refrigerated spaces really need to be at lower temperatures, or can they be increased even a little bit. Um, managing suction pressure can yield annual energy system savings up to about 10%, which is pretty significant. Next slide. Uh, so the second way of decreasing lift uh, across the compressor is by decreasing discharge pressure. Um, discharge pressures are often set to accommodate the worst case ambient conditions. So that would be the highest summer condensing temperature which corresponds to the highest pressure. But if we let the discharge pressure float with ambient conditions, uh, the discharge can be lowered, can be lowered during cool, cooler periods uh, and reduce energy usage by anywhere from five to 12% per year. Again, pretty significant. Um, decreasing condensing temperature just by one degree will reduce input power anywhere from one and a half to 2%. So these compressors are obviously very sensitive to, to lift when we look at energy consumption. Next slide. So the second uh, efficiency opportunity comes from managing part load performance. Um, systems operate most of the time at partial load. And the reason for that is because the ambient conditions change throughout the year. They're, they're dependent largely on weather. <clears throat> so equipment and operating strategies are play a very important role in maximizing efficiency. And really two, two areas for opportunity here are compressor staging, loading and unloading, and using VFDs, variable frequency drives. Next slide. So when we're talking about reciprocating compressors, uh, they have cylinder unloading, usually have very good part load performance. Um, and by managing staging, uh, we help to manage suction pressure. Um, even with reciprocating compressors, it makes sense to base load as many compressors as you can in a multi-compressor system, and then use, part, uh, use one or two compressors, depending on the number, um, to to uh, uh, match load and to allow better control. And generally, the more unloading stages, the better overall control is in load matching. Next slide. Screw compressors, uh, as I mentioned before, generally have poor part load performance when they're using slide valves. Um, so any compressor using a slide valve control for capacity should be base loaded most of the time if possible. Um, if you have a multi-compressor system, again, um, one compressor should be base loaded or, or however many compressors are in the system that can be base loaded should be base loaded. And then one should be used to match load. Um, variable frequency drives increase part load efficiency significantly. Um, if you look at the, uh, the chart, which is really just uh, for illustration purposes, <clears throat> but still pretty accurate. Um, a screw compressor operating at 50% capacity under slide valve control is going to use 75% of the input power to get to uh, provide that 50% capacity compared to a VFD where 50% um, capacity means you'll be just a little bit above that. You'll be closer to 60% of input power. Uh, so partial load um, 
performance on screw compressors is uh, is is an issue, and if DFDs are um, an option for those compressors, they should be used. The energy savings can be very significant. <clears throat> next or, uh, next slide, please. And finally, we'll talk about sequencing strategies. Um, I've mentioned some of this as we're, as I was going through um, the different compressor types and controls. Uh, but basically, sequencing, stra sequencing strategies should be designed to match the load with all but the last compressor operating at or near full load. That maximizes the efficiency of those compressors. Um, in systems where you have both screw compressors and reciprocating compressors, um, screw compressors should be base loaded as much as possible, especially if they use slide valve control. Um, Screw compressors with VFDs, however, can be used as trim compressors, and they may be most, the most efficient alternative in a multi-compressor system. Um, the worst case would be operating multiple screw compressors without VFDs at partial load. Um, and I've seen this happen before where um, the refrigeration system operator uh, will operate multiple compressors at partial load, thinking kind of that it reduces wear and tear on the compressors. That may be true to some extent, um, but it comes at a pretty severe energy penalty. Um, so by properly staging and loading compressors, you can reduce annual system energy usage by anywhere from about five to 15%. Next slide. So now we'll move on to defrost controls. Um, defrosting, of course, is required to prevent ice buildup on evaporator coils. Um, and that occurs whenever you have a refrigerated space that has to operate um, at or below freezing. And also in some higher temperature systems because of the temperature differential between the refrigerant and the refrigerated space. So whenever the coil temperature drops below freezing, you'll get frost. Um, and defrosting needs to be controlled because most of the defrost methods increase refrigeration loads because we're adding heat to the refrigerated space. Um, frost buildup depends on a lot of factors, but it includes the local humidity, infiltration rates, what kind of product is being stored. So there are a lot of things that affect frost buildup. Next slide. Um, so Let's talk a little bit about the defrost methods before we get into um, how, to, how to improve energy efficiency there. Um, the first one is air defrost. Um, and this is very simply where the evaporator fans stay on to melt the frost when the refrigerant is shut off. Um, this can be used when the refrigerated space temperature is above 32 degrees, um, and it doesn't add heat to the refrigerated space. So, in, in those applications, it's the most efficient type of defrosting available. Uh, the second type uh, is very simple. It's electric defrost. Uh, it just uses electric heating elements to melt the ice on the coils, but it's the lowest efficiency in terms of electricity usage. Um, electric defrost tends to be more common um, in smaller package systems. Um, and we've seen this even in places where air defrost could be an option. Um, the third is hot gas defrost. And, and basically what that does is take hot gas from the compressor discharge um, and goes through a, um, um, a valve train uh, during certain cycles to discharge the, or to uh, melt frost from the, uh, from the coils. Next slide. So how do we improve defrost controls? Uh, regardless of the defrosting method, the key objective is to minif minimize both frequency and duration of defrosting. The most common kind of control are time clocks, uh, but it's, a, it's an imprecise method. Um, the reason is because of all of the variability that you get in, in ambient conditions, particularly humidity. Um, and the tendency is to set the clocks up in a way that assures that the coils are defrosted, uh, but may actually be running them too frequently. Um, a second way of doing that is using something called liquid runtime controls. Um, this measures the amount of time an evaporator is in the cooling mode. Um, so 
after a uh, given amount of time, it uh, will go into the defrost cycle and makes defrosting less fre less frequent when there are when you're in a low demand period. And then third is uh, frost sensors, and frost sensors measures frost buildup directly to start and stop the defrosting cycle. Um, probably the best option in terms of control, a little bit more expensive. Um, and usually it's, um, it's on larger systems and larger evaporators. Um, but the point is that actively managing defrosting, uh, both frequency and duration, can reduce system energy usage by about 3%. So it's a pretty significant savings. Next slide. I want to talk uh, specifically here about hot gas defrost and improving those types of controls. Um, hot gas defrost is unique because of the way it uses the, the um, compressed gas discharge from the compressor. Um, the objective is to really avoid sending back a lot of vapor to the compressor suction because that's a source of inefficiency. Um, so, the, so what we're trying to do is get as much of that gas to condense in the evaporator during the defrosting cycle as possible. Um, in a multi-stage system, that condensed gas should go back to the compressor with the highest suction pressure. Um, sending it back to the low stage is also a source of inefficiency. Um, regulators should be sized and adjusted to avoid too much defrost gas flow. That's a common problem. Um, and something that's a little bit newer are automatic liquid drainers. They're a lot like steam traps, and what they do is uh, separate the, the liquid refrigerant going back to the compress going back to um, the system um, from the uh, from the vapor. So we're trying to re reduce the amount of vapor going back. Next slide. So we're going to switch topics to unnecessary refrigeration loads. A um, couple of different categories there, actually several different categories there. One has to do with uh, refrigerated space design and insulation, uh, in infiltration, refrigerant line insulation, uh, parasitic loads, destratification, and inventory management. It covers a, a pretty wide range of topics. Next slide. So regarding refrigerated space, um, first thing that should be done is a review of design and operations. And first and foremost in that is answering the question, is the space being used for the design purpose? Um, if, it's, if a space is underutilized or perhaps um, the temperature ranges have changed, but the main mechanical configuration remains the same, that may be an opportunity for um, repurposing, repiping, adding controls, changing control set points, and so forth that are very simple, easy to do, and can yield pretty significant efficiency. Um, second thing is reviewing insulation levels and operating temperatures. Um, older spaces um, may not be insulated to levels that are appropriate for, for um, energy efficiency. Um, temperatures may be set uh, too low for what the product is. Um, all of those things should be reviewed. And then finally, um, just managing inventory loading and unloading, mainly to avoid unnecessary entry, which is a big source of infiltration. Um, in terms of reducing infiltration sources, uh, the idea is to reduce both sensible and latent loads. You want to try to reduce as much of the humidity entering the space as you can. That reduces defrost requirements, um, which is a significant load on the refrigeration system. Uh, and finally, looking for opportunities to apply strip curtains, fast roll doors, vestibules, and other means of reducing the amount of air in and out of the system. Um, thirdly, reducing parasitic loads uh, for lighting. Um, many of the larger uh, refrigerated spaces that we go into have HID lighting uh, and fluorescent lighting. Um, those can easily be replaced with LED lighting. You can use occupancy sensors, um, and that has um, an impact on the overall heat load in the refrigerated space. And then finally, destratification. In high bay refrigerated spaces, the cold air tends to settle, of course, but 
temperature sensors are often located um, high up in the space, and that can cause unnecessary evaporator operation, uh, which is now a higher refrigeration load than is really necessary, and it may be overcooling uh, the product below. Um, so destratification can be accomplished in a number of ways, including using um, hoods on the evaporator fans, uh, separate destratification fans, um, socks over the uh, evaporator hoods. There are a lot of ways to help with that. Um, but basically, the idea is to try to equalize the temperature so that you're, you're neither undercooling nor overcooling. Next slide. So now we get into other component efficiencies, um, evaporator fan motors, condenser fan motors, and heat recovery. Um, evaporator fan motors um, on larger systems um, use VFDs where possible. Um, that can yield up to 2% annual system energy savings. On smaller um, package systems, um, but even on larger systems with smaller evaporators, um, there is an opportunity that has presented itself where, where single phase shaded pole motors are used on fans. Those motors have efficiencies that are often under 50%, which is pretty poor for, for a motor. They can be replaced with electronically commutated motors or ECMs, uh, which will get the motor efficiency up to 80 plus percent, uh, depending on the size of the motor. So there's an opportunity with those types of motors. Um, on condenser fan motors, basically the same thing. Use DFDs where possible, um, up to about 3% annual energy efficiency savings. Um, on smaller package systems, again, use ECMs where they can where they can be applied. The last opportunity is heat recovery. Um, compressor heat recovery can be used for a lot of different things, including underfloor heating. Um, boiler makeup feed water in the case of a food processing plant, for example, if there's a boiler on site as well. Um, and it can also be used to uh, provide hot water for cleaning. And basically heat recovery is just uh, taking that, that um, superheat off of the compressor discharge, um, using it to um, warm up water, and then the cooled gas then goes to the condenser where a lot less heat needs to be rejected. Um, and that, that can yield up to 4% system energy savings depending on the configuration. Now, sometimes it increases the energy input to the compressor because there's an additional pressure drop, um, but that's usually offset pretty substantially by the energy that's recovered. So we're at the wrap-up stage here, and uh, just a couple of quick thoughts here. Um, first is uh, there are a lot of savings that can be found in industrial refrigeration systems if you know where to look, and hopefully I've uh, been able to help out with that today. Um, secondly, consider a refrigeration audit, especially if you have uh, complex systems. Um, a refrigeration audit can often identify a lot of uh, the uh, you know, proverbial low-hanging fruit that can be addressed using controls and other operating modifications that are usually low cost, but can still provide pretty significant um, energy efficiency improvements. And that's before you even get to replacing major equipment components. So I think with that, we are ready to take some questions. Oh, the last slide uh, is contact information. Um, I'm the assistant director. Uh, my email is listed there, and Keith Gosen is the director of the IAC. And if you're interested in conducting an assessment in the Mid-Atlantic region, uh, contact us um, or likewise contact us with any questions about the presentation. So that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Ralph. Um, as a reminder to the attendees, if you have a question, please type it into the questions box and then we can read it aloud um, for Ralph to answer. Um, we had one question about whether or not the webinar would be recorded and posted. Um, and the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the EPA's pollution prevention webpage within a few weeks. Um, we don't have any other questions at this time, but um, Can I ask a question? 
Yes, please do. <laughs> Ralph, um, just as a general rule of thumb, uh, in case you were you know trying to do quick calculations, would a would a uh, a rough breakdown of compressor, evaporator, and condenser um, annual energies be like 70, 20, 10? Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about right in most cases, Keith. Okay. And I had another question too, because I've I've seen this and I was wondering about it. When when people are using hot gas defrost, are they supposed to turn the fan, evaporator fans off during that cycle? Yeah, because you don't want to circulate cold right. air over the coils while you're defrosting. Right. Okay. So so that should be that should be already programmed that way during hot cast defrost. The, the evaporator coil uh, fan should be forced off. Yes. Okay. Those were my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question that came in. What are the most common operational improvements you see during assessments? Operational improvements usually revolve around things like temperature set points and recommending um, converting to suction pressure control and floating head pressure control. Um, those are those are the, the biggest opportunities um, often in in larger systems. Um, compressor sequencing and um, and DFD applications probably come in a close second there. Um, many of the plants we, the, the, at least that I've seen, um, tend to do a pretty adequate job with sequencing. Um, it, it varies from, from place to place, of course. Um, but, but I'd say the most common recommendations are, you know, look at the temperature set points and consider suction pressure and discharge pressure control. If I could just add there, um... I mean, it, it, it seems a, a bit astonishing, and there's actually uh, operational reasons why uh, people don't put their evaporator fans in automatic mode, uh, but I see lots of cases where the fans are continuously on when they could be in fan automatic mode. So that's one I, I see a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a couple more questions come in. The first is, does the Udell Center cover Kentucky? And if not, do you have a referral for Kentucky? We don't we don't cover Kentucky. Um, no. But uh, uh, Keith, I think the closest IAC there would be in either North Ohio Carolina. or Tennessee or North Carolina, depending on depending on the location in Kentucky. Yeah, I, I think it would be the uh, University of North Carolina. Okay, thank you. Um, when is it worth to put a VFD on a condenser slash evaporator fan? I'm sorry, when is it? Could you repeat that? Sure. Um, when is it worth it to put a VFD on a condenser or evaporator fan? Um, I think the rule of thumb with, uh, with VFDs is that it, uh, well, one qualifier to start with, if you have uh, two speed fans on an, on an evaporator, some of them come equipped like that, it's probably not worth it. Um, VFDs would be applied typically when you have three phase evaporator fans and um, the combined horsepower, because you don't have to put an individual VFD on every evaporator fan, um, but I'd say the combined horsepower in any given space should probably exceed five or 10 horsepower. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, have any industry case studies been developed showing savings of particular facilities? Uh, we, <laughs> we're working actually, we were, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were working on that and then uh, COVID-19 hit. <laughs> so it was hard to get the attention of some of the, uh, some of the places where we've done these assessments. So we haven't, we haven't put together those case studies yet. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, is there a specific way to calculate the impact of operation changes, such as increasing condenser temperature on energy efficiency? 
like how the energy savings is estimated? Yeah, um, but with um, if, if you're if you're considering changing the temperature within a refrigerated space, um, there's a direct correlation between the temperature and the evaporator pressure, and essentially that raises the suction pressure pressure to the compressor, and that can all be worked out using uh, characteristic curves from the compressor and um, uh, actually, you can do it by experimentation too. We've we've encouraged some plants to do that, where they just change the um, refrigerated space temperature by a couple of degrees, and they monitor the compressor power uh, over a period of time, kind of compare A to B, and uh, um, and and see for themselves what they're what they're likely to save. But the rule of thumb is uh, back on that one slide by raising suction pressure well by raising suction temperature by one degree Fahrenheit you can reduce compressor power by about two percent um, so so that's a, um, a rule of thumb that can be used to estimate okay thank you um, our next question is do you recommend replacing fans to lighter fans in evaporators for energy efficiency Lighter fans? Um, no, we've we've never recommended that. I don't think you'll find energy efficiency savings by installing lighter fans necessarily. Um, once okay. once it's running, you know, it's it that that would affect the 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 speed or the time that the fan comes up to speed but I don't think it would affect the overall energy efficiency. That's really more a function of the motor and the fan, and the fan type, um, whether it's an axial fan or a centrifugal fan. If, if I understood the question correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, our last question is, in an existing system that uses electric defrost, do you consider that a hot gas defrost system could be an alternative to improve the system? It would certainly improve energy efficiency um, by eliminating electric defrost. The, the trade-off would be the additional piping and controls you would need to add to get that, that hot gas over to the evaporators. Um, and returning it to back to the system. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that would vary depending on the plant, and it would probably be a good idea to consult um, whoever uh, manages the refrigeration system, um, whether it's a contractor or, or an in-house engineer, to um, to see whether or not that would that would make sense. If it's a high enough temperature space, if it's above freezing, um, then I would consider using air defrost if possible. Otherwise, you'd have to go to some other form of defrost, like hot gas defrost. Okay. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, those are all the questions that we had for today. So I think with that, we can end today's presentation. And as a reminder, a post-webinar survey will open once you close out of the webinar. Um, if you could take a moment to respond to the survey, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, Keith, Olivia.